Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the tutorial, first tutorial of the uh, Applied Category Theory Conference um, that's happening this coming week. And uh, I'm glad you could all come. Um, so, as I said before, uh, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and Paolo will answer them or, uh, and, and then maybe he'll, he'll uh, ask, he'll tell them to me. Um, so I'm going to talk about is an introduction to applied category theory. And I put it down there in purple, something really good that's happening in the world because somehow while uh, in the US our, our national pride is <laughs> kind of an all time low apparently or a low, recent low, uh, in a world where things are kind of confusing, I personally find category theory to be something very positive that is really uh, up and coming and um, that I think is worth taking a look at. So, um, yeah. So as an introduction, which I don't have very many slides because this whole this whole um, this whole talk will be an introduction in some sense. Uh, so I want to say, who is this intro really for? Um, if you know what a category and functor already, if you already know what these are, then you're probably not going to learn much from this, but you're still welcome. Um, if you don't know what a category or a functor are, or even know much math or remember math, uh, that then it's more for you. I've tried to design it as a way of, it's a, a, a way of just kind of introducing what this whole subject is about. So because you don't know what categories and functors are, and yet I'm telling you they're kind of the basis of this whole subject, let me just quickly say kind of what they are. So a, cate a category is a network of relationships. Hmm, that's not very good writing. Uh, a category is a network of relationships. So that's, uh, that's pretty vague. It's a math thing, so it really is pure math. Uh, it can, it's as rigorous as any other kind of math. And so when you see network of relationships, it really is a precise idea, but I'm not gonna tell you the precise idea today um, in like precise mathematical terms. Uh, a functor is a connection between categories. So if you have a category and some kind of like network of relationships, of different things that are connected together, I don't know, maybe they're just arrows or something, all sorts of different things all talking to each other in different ways. Um, then that whole thing could be in a network of, of a higher level with different networks of relationships, mine, yours, Bob's, Alice's, and these different networks of relationships can be connected uh, by what are called functors. So, um, but you don't have to know, that's very vague. And so what, before we kind of look into categories and functors and, and what this whole subject is, um, and we're not really gonna go into it deeply again, but we're gonna try to say how it feels to do category theory. I wanna ask what math even is. So there was a time when you took, um, when you took math classes in college or high school or middle school, and you might've learned about algebra and that's a study of equations, maybe x squared equals y or something. And then there's like geometry. And that's a study of shapes, maybe different shapes. But even before that, there's number. Hmm, that writing is pretty bad today. Two, three, one, right? And what do all these different things have in common? I, it's kind of hard. I, I'm, I want to leave that as an open question. I don't presume to know what math is, but one thing I think it is, is it's like stable thought patterns that can survive and last a really long time. So the number two, whether you're today or uh, 3000 years ago or something, you probably understood it as a couple dots, or maybe you understood it as a couple goats. Sorry, my... Um, couple of different goats or something. So you have some world where you're looking in that world and you're seeing two of something. And that notion of two, our understanding of like maybe who Alexander the Great was or what a person is may have changed through time. But two, I think is a relatively stable thought pattern. And because it's so stable, it can 
it can be passed and communicated between people. And in the same way, numbers, algebra, geometry, these are relatively stable thought patterns that can be translated between people and can allow us to coordinate. Um, so again, that's all pretty vague, uh, but, but what I want to say is that all of these things are kind of part of a larger structure um, of math and that category theory likes to think about, in, when we think categorically, we like to think about uh, math as a whole and as its parts and how they kind of, how those parts fit together uh, into that whole. And so I want to start with something more concrete, but uh, simple. So I'm going to just draw some numbers here. And um, I'm going to draw an arrow from one number to another. If So the arrow means, so there's an arrow from A to B, means that A divides evenly or perfectly into B. If you don't remember what that means, it means that like you can have two, three twos to get six or two threes to get six, right? So they go in evenly, but two does not go evenly into five. Uh, two does go evenly into 10. Uh, three goes evenly into 15, five goes evenly into 15, and five goes evenly into 10. And all these go into 30. And of course, there's lots of numbers I didn't draw here, but these are eight numbers, I guess, with arrows when one goes evenly into another. But also there's an arrow, uh, there's a path from one all the way up to 30, or from one all the way up to six. And uh, that's because one goes perfectly into six. So not only an arrow means it divides evenly, but any path means that it divides evenly into it. And so this is a network of relationships. There's a lot more things in this network. There's four that I didn't draw and stuff like that. But um, it's a network of relationships. And so it's a category. And uh, it's, um, it's one that somebody invented. Namely, uh, I think I got this from Eugenia Cheng. It's a little category that someone invented for explanatory purposes. And category theorists invent categories all the time. They invent them for reasons that they have for thinking about the world in their particular way. And we're gonna look at this little category of eight objects and some number of arrows uh, as, uh, because it's gonna help us explain a, an idea from category theory, namely um, uh, the notion of product. So in category theory, we look for general patterns uh, that persist or we find all around mathematics. So product very vaguely is, um, or in very loose terms is, um, the last thing that goes into both. So that's like a very weird grammatical construction. But the product of A and B is the, is the last thing that goes into both A and B. And what the heck am I talking about there? Well, um, let's talk about, let's say you have two numbers in this thing here, six and 10, and you wanna look at the product, the product of these two in this network of relationships. Well, it's something that goes into six and 10, and I didn't tell you what goes into means yet, but what I mean is it has an arrow into six and 10. And so what things on here have an arrow into six and 10 or a path? Well, six doesn't have an arrow to 10, so that's out. And 15 doesn't have an arrow to 10, but two does have an arrow to six and to 10. So that's good. And one has an arrow to both six and 10. But the last thing that has an arrow or a path to both six and 10 is two. So two would be the product of six and 10. And product is a weird word. It's a category theoretic word, but what we're gonna say instead is that, that what's going on here, I would open this up to ideas, but maybe you already can tell, um, or some of you remember this terminology. It's not too important, but it's called the greatest common divisor. The greatest common divisor of two and 10 is the last thing that goes into both. It's the biggest number that divides evenly into both six and 10. So the GCD of six and 15 is the last thing that goes into both and that's three. And the GCD of 15 and 15 is 15 because it goes into both. And it's the last thing that goes into both. Now, why would I say, why would I do this weird thing? 
Well, GCD, it's like, oh, I remember that from my past. That's kind of weird. Okay, GCD is important in category theory, apparently. I don't know if I've ever used it in my life. Okay, that's me being some, being uh, thinking about how I might imagine you're seeing this, some people. But let's just reverse the arrows, and then we'll see, and then you'll say, uh, okay, GCD and whatever this is. Well, I still don't know if this goes into my life. And, but we'll try to just keep going through lots of different parts of math or lots of different examples of the same construct over and over and see different ideas coming out. And that's the idea of category theory is to find these commonalities. Um, so what, what is the last thing that goes into both here? So let's say you have two things, two and three, and you want something that goes into both. The last thing that goes into both, well, 30 goes into both because it goes in that way into two, uh, and it goes, I don't know, lots of different ways into three, different ways into two. So 30 goes into both, but the last thing that goes into both, two and three, is what's called the least common multiple. The last thing that goes into both six and 10 is 30. So that's the least common multiple of six and 10. So Okay, all we did was reverse the arrows and we have two different categories. This one, this is Alice's category. This one's Bob's, actually this one's Eugenia's category. This one is um, Eugene's category. And uh, they're just opposites of each other. The arrows go the other way and we're getting uh, GCD and LCM. But let's just keep going with the number theme because um, it's easy. So what if we use this number scheme instead? This is a category also. Uh, I'm sorry, think. Dave. Yep. So uh, people are asking mm -hmm. if there are also undrawn arrows from each number to itself. There are undrawn arrows from each number to itself. Thanks for asking. I didn't draw any paths except for paths of length one. So there, there's also a path, whoops, there's also a path from two all the way to 30. So that's a length two path. But as someone's asking, there's also a a path from a number to itself. It's just a length zero path. It's kind of like you're already where you are. Um, it's called the identity. So uh, here in this picture that I've drawn, um, what's the last thing that goes into both A and B? Well, if you pick A and B and you say, I want something that goes into both. Well, two goes into both and one goes into both, but four does not go into both. So the last thing that goes into both, where you, as Paolo just asked, and as some people astutely asked, the last thing that goes into both, um, say three and five, is the min. It's the smaller of the two. That's pretty, well, yeah, so what, what is the min? It's the last thing that goes into both. So we've recovered GCD, greatest common divisor, which you might have forgotten, LCM, the least common multiple, which you might have forgotten. But min, everyone kind of knows what's smaller, four, three or five, what's smaller, four or seven. It's the last thing that goes into both. And in the same way, if we reverse the arrows, in the same way as above, we could reverse the arrows and see this is another category. Everyone, you, in category theory, people make up categories all the time to explain things that they're seeing. And in this category, the last thing that goes into both three and five is five. So you get max. And this notion of product, which is the last thing that goes into both, is recovering, meaning uh, we're getting back um, notions from all over, mm, kind of like number theory, the theory of numbers. Um, we're getting the notion of min, max, GCD, LCM, least common multiple, stuff like that. Let's do another totally different kind of example that doesn't involve numbers, but instead less involves like space. So here's a space. And maybe you could, so in Alice's space, what she's seeing here is every dot in this whole region is in this space. Whereas maybe uh, somebody else, they just wanna look at like this many dots. And either way you look at it, this following conversation will make sense. So you could think of these as being all the dots in the space, or you could think of there being um, every possible dot. 
And uh, what I'm going to be looking at in my network of relationships that I'm going to use is subsets. So there's that subset, there's this subset. The red subset is not uh, contiguous, but it's still a subset. Uh, the green subset, that's this one here. Um, and the purple subset, that'll be uh, this one. Hmm. Okay, um, so in this network of relationships, the black one includes all of the dots. The green one includes some of the dots. The purple one includes some of the dots. The blue one includes some of the dots. And the red one includes some of the dots. And I'm going to draw a little arrow between them um, when, they're con when one set of dots is contained in another set of dots. And so the purple one is contained in the red one. And now I've drawn part of this network of relationships, but the network of relationships I'm talking about has all possible subsets here. So any subset you can draw. So you have this one, that would be down here pointing to blue, and you have, et cetera. So all possible subsets are in this network of relationships. It's a huge network of relationships with probably hundreds of thousands or millions of, of dots in it in this network of relations. So this network of, relation is, of relationships is somehow talking about this uh, set and subsets over there. So here's subsets, subsets, okay? Now, we're going back to this category theory idea of the product. So suppose you have two subsets, say blue and red. What's the GCD or LCM or whatever it is, the product of blue and red. Well, it's the last thing that goes into both. But what's a thing here? A thing is a subset. So what's the last thing that goes into both blue and red? It's a subset, it's a number of dots, and it has to go into blue and red, meaning it has to be a subset of both blue and red, but it can't be, it has to be the biggest possible subset. It's the last one that goes into both. So it's, it's actually this intersection here. It is the intersection, intersection. Intersection just means in the Venn diagram, it's this part. It's the last thing that goes into both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And in the same way, if we reverse the arrows here, we could do it again, okay? We could do the same story again. We could take this picture and we could copy it. And, um, but we could, instead of having the arrows go in the direction we did up there, we could have the arrows go in the backwards direction Whoops. So now uh, we have black and we have red. And again, the last thing that goes into both is something important. It, every time we do this, we seem to see something important happening um, when we pick, at least when we pick these good networks of relationships, the ones that I picked for this example, um, we're seeing good things happen. We're seeing old fashioned mathematical ideas uh, coming out. So green is in black and this one, and this one, and this one, and then Purple is in red. And so, oops, I went backwards. I wanted to draw my arrows backwards this time. Uh, the last thing that goes into both now, say you want the last thing that goes into both uh, blue and red again. The last thing that goes into both, well, into has become backwards. So the last thing that both red and blue go into now. The last thing that both red and blue go into well, I guess it'd be the first thing, because we've reversed everything. We've made opposite land. So uh, the first thing that goes into both blue and red is, um, well, it's the union. It's the, it's, hmm, 
it's this really weird picture uh, that would be kind of both of these guys, the union. I'm sorry, it David. It contains someone... both, and it's the smallest thing that does. Hi, Paolo. Hey, someone is pointing out that there should be also a red to purple arrow. Oops, thanks. Yep. So this is a big network of relationships I've only drawn five dots in, and really there's hundreds of thousands or millions of dots in here. And for any two dots in this, in this picture here, you pick any two dots in this picture, and they will have a product. And that product will correspond over in this picture to the union of the um, two, two subsets. Um, so this same idea, GCD, LCM, min, max, union, uh, it also comes to from, you can find it in programming, people use it um, in regular set theory. It turns out that the product of three and five, maybe you've heard of products, maybe when you think product, you think times. And that's great because in the theory of sets, there's a category called the category of sets where the product of three and four would be this 12 element set here. And that's, I'm not going to tell you the category. You can learn about it. It's one of the most famous categories that there is. If you learn category theory and get to know all the celebrities of categories, uh, the category of sets is a big celebrity in category theory. Um, and there you get this notion of product. But uh, again, it, it generalizes lots and lots of things that we find all over the place. So let me back out again from the, these specifics and say what we're doing. Category theory looks for common patterns throughout math. And now, starting in this applied category theory era, it's, it's kind of always been applied, but it's getting more, even more applied now. Uh, we look for patterns beyond pure math. So I wanted to point out um, what might be obvious or might not be obvious. And that was that all of math was invented by somebody to help them think about some aspect of their world. Um, there was somebody who had the, the time, the privilege, the inclination to try to take something they were seeing in their world and put it down into a rigorous pattern, uh, into a rigorous uh, language and method for thinking. So for example, uh, there is Euclid. And Euclid thought about shapes and lines. He noticed shapes and lines were important for thinking about geometry, um, for thinking about distance, for thinking about relationships in space. And so he wrote down in this classic book called The Elements, um, or a bunch of books, uh, the, the rules for thinking about shapes and lines and things like that. Um, skipping ahead, you have Newton and Leibniz. And these people thought about rates of change, how fast one celestial body is moving with rel relative to another, how fast things change in time. If you have more, if you have more masks, do you get less COVID or the same amount, you get much better, much more, much less. How do they relate to each other? Uh, just trying to think about, you know, if I do this, how fast does it change that? Um, so what else, who else was there? There is Pascal and Fermat. And these people thought about probability, games of chance, how likely are things? So they, they invented, the field of probability because they wanted to understand how chance works. And they did it their own way. They, you, if you had tried to do it back then, you, would, you might have done it differently. Um, or you might have done something similar. So that's, that's an open question. But the point is these people invented uh, these ideas. So what else, who else was there? There's Boole. Boole invented logic. So, um, like and and or, and how and and or work. Um, what are the rules for logic, for thinking, uh, for mathematical statements and how they're put together? There's, who else would I want to say? There's Noether. She thought about what abstract, al what algebra really is. 
Like what are the rule systems for algebra for manipulating um, X's and Y's variables, uh, numbers, um, things like that. She also thought about physics and how conservation laws are related to symmetries and very, in, in, um, so, right, so abstract algebra. There's say Turing, this is the last one I'll do, computation. What is computation? How does it really work? How should we think about it? So all these people invented something and those things that they invented changed their world and, and allowed people to communicate across distances and coordinate with each other to think about how probability works or how shapes and lines work or how things change with respect to each other. So for all of these people, they invented a system of thinking. They thought about, uh, they invented math to think about some aspect of life. Category theory was invented in the 40s to consider bridges between all of them. And so from my point of view, I'm seeing it as like the very project of math itself. What do I, is being considered in category theory. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if all these people thought about their world and said, I think what I need to talk about that no one said yet is formal logic, the rules of thinking. Or I, I think that the rule, what I need to say that no one's thought about is abstract algebra, the rules of al algebraic manipulation. All these people took something from the world and they expressed it in mathematics. And now what we're doing is we're finding these common themes throughout all those, all those different approaches. And that doesn't mean that we have this, grab, this kind of kludge together thing with 42, uh, we, you know, all the famous mathematicians are kludged together into some crazy weird uh, grab bag thing. It means that we found some common patterns and abstractions that reach, that, 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 that take all of these ideas and put them together uh, or allow them to live in a larger world where they are, they can remain themselves. They can, the rules of probability remain the rules of probability in category theory. When category theory thinks about geometry, the rules of geometry stay the same. Uh, when it thinks about calculus, we look at how calculus actually is and we think about it from category theory point of view. So we are not changing these things. We're letting them be there, but we're finding some system or principles that, that encompass or allow us to speak about and translate between all sorts of different aspects of math. And by doing that, we're kind of finding what math is in some sense. Uh, not all it could be, but, but all that it has been, it, in some sense, is being found in category theory. So let me go to categories again, be a little more concrete again. Um, so, so some different categories. There's the category of space and continuous mappings. So in this one, the network of relationships would include things like this space there. That would be in the network of relationships. And another one would be this sphere here. That would be in the network of relationships. And what are the arrows? What are the connections? How are things related? Things are related by continuous mapping. So a way of putting this space in this sphere continuously. Continuously means that as someone walks around in this space uh, uh, without jumping, they don't just like go from there all the way to there in some weird jump. Um, uh, it, they walk also continuously through the mapped space. And so this world of relationships this network of relationships or category called top for topological spaces has in it every single possible topological space. And you say, well, how could it possibly have every single one? Um, it's kind of like X has every number in it, quote unquote. It's not quite the same. It's a kind of weird analogy, uh, but um, it's a world of thinking. It's an abstract platonic realm or something where you can think about every space and all the continuous mappings between them. So all the triangles are in there, all the squares, but so are all the 3D shapes that you could think. Oh, by the way, the product in the category of spaces, if you take a circle, the open circle and the open circle and you product them together, it turns out you get the torus, that little shape there. What's going on there is that as someone walks around here, it's like they're walking around the torus around the donut. And as they walk here, 
it's like they're walking through the donut. So this notion of GCD and uh, greatest common divisor and min and max and all that sort of stuff um, turns out to give us the torus from the two circles. So that's a category, the category of all spaces and continuous mappings. There's also the category of resources and processes. Oh, I meant to copy that in. Oh, well, um, maybe I'll go try to find it. Um, this thing, I don't know if I can copy this in, but I'm just gonna look at it here then. Um, so here's resources and processes. So this is a category. It's the category of all resources you can make, say, uh, yeah. So what are some objects in here? We've kind of drawn things funny, a little bit different, but when preparing a lemon meringue pie, all of these guys, whoops, are gonna be resources. Crust is a resource. It's good to have crust and lemon is a resource and butter is a resource. And the arrows, are more general kinds of arrows. This thing is serving, that thing there, make lemon filling, is serving as a kind of multi-arrow multi that takes lemon, butter, sugar, and yolk and produces lemon filling. Um, so that's what this thing is here. Okay, so in this little character I'm drawing now, um, it's a resource theory. And lemon filling is a resource, and meringue is a resource, some white eggy stuff. Um, and all of these boxes are converters that take like an egg and convert it into two things, it, yolk and white. And that's what the separate egg does. And make lemon filling takes lemon butter, sugar, and yolk and makes lemon filling. And fill crusts makes some kind of like pre-pie thing. And when you add meringue, you get this unbaked pie. And so what we're getting is a network of resources and how they can be combined. Uh, that is a category called a resource theory. Um, in algebra, we deal with unknowns, right? If you want, or if you remember back to algebra, you might have like y minus x squared equals three and y plus x equals nine or something like that. Um, then you graph this and y minus x squared equals three, y equals x squared plus three. Okay, I'm just gonna do some quick math here. Y equals nine minus x, that's like this. So in this network of relationships, I guess what I could say the network of relationships is, is all systems of equations in x and y, in two variables. So you've got all these different systems of equations. Like here's a system of equations, x equals two, y equals seven. That's a system of equations. That's another system of equations. And I have a arrow from this one to this one because if x equals two and y equals seven, then y minus x squared equals three and y plus x equals nine. So you might say, well, how did you come up with this? That an arrow is like, if then, you never told me that in advance. It's true, I made up my own category and my category has in it all systems of equations in X and Y. And whenever one implies another, then I have an arrow. And this allows you to look at um, all shapes, you know, sine waves and all sorts of stuff in the plane in, our, in two variables, X and Y, and allows you to think about how different ones of them include other ones of them. You could even allow like x plus y is less than seven or something and get like, get like subsets that are really big. So this is another world, this is another network of relationships, um, algebraic equations and how they imply each other. Or logic, here's maybe one of the last ones and I'll start, I'll just open it up to questions in a few minutes. But in logic, uh, you might have things like if A, or B, then C. That is a rule. Okay, that's a logical statement. Someone else has a logical statement that says, if A, then C, but also, if B, then C. And you can ask whether these two things are the same. Statement one and statement two. And in, in logic, 
it's all about whether one statement implies another statement. So in fact, these two statements would be the same. If A or B happens, then C happens. Well, then if A happens, C happens. And if B happens, then C happens. So, or in logic, maybe you think about these weird, uh, I remember these kind of weird logic puzzles where like you have some facts. Remember these things? Like uh, you have like people, person, another person, and people might be in relationship with each other. And then you have like jobs, and then you have like uh, days or something. I don't know if you've seen these logic puzzles. And these are where you take facts and you put them together to solve things. And it's not quite what people mean by logic in math, but it's pretty close. Maybe it even is, I don't know. I, I probably should have thought that through a little more. Um, taking facts and putting them together. Uh, this is the, maybe I should have been careful because all these other ones I've talked about really are rigorously uh, categories. Whereas this one here, um, is it a category or not? That's something that someone, if they are interested in, they could actually try to pursue the question, is that a category? And how does thinking about it as a category help me uh, solve it? Oops. So one last thing, I don't know if, if this will be useful either, but I kind of wanted to summarize uh, before I open it up to questions and you can ask questions about the math or anything else, but like category theory has a lot of good stuff from a lot of different, takes a lot of positive things, I think. So like in social terms, the conservatives would say, well, I like that it benefits from the wisdom of math already invented. You're not throwing anything away. You're not, you're not throwing it all away and starting over. You're taking what we already have and you're, you're using it. That's great. And a libertarian might say, I really like that you're free to create as you see fit. You can make anything you want and you're working within this background framework that's minimally invasive. It doesn't make a lot of rules for you, but it is highly functional. I like that it kind of keeps everyone in line while uh, like uh, satisfying some formal contracts or something while still being, uh, I'm still free to create. And a progressive might say, I like about category that, that theory that everyone can contribute to making their own world, making it more rich, adding new ideas, uh, making it more meaningful, understanding connections between things. A modern viewpoint would say, I like that it's completely rigorous, that it's been used in proving well-known conjectures that people thought were important to prove, but also that it's interesting, it's useful in science and, and technology. And a, a postmodern person might say, I like that, um, that no perspective is right, that, that there's just all sorts of different categories, but that navigating between these perspectives lets you look at problems from all sides. Or a hippie might say, I like that it's all about relationship and connection or irrelevant, I don't know what that means. Maybe a, a practical person might say that I like that it's, that we can actually use it to organize and learn from big data in today's world or to manage complexity of software projects that are, that are very large and changing all the time. I like that you can think about AI and other complex systems with this stuff. I think it's relevant and practical for right now. So that's, that's my uh, tutorial, or that's the, the part I'm gonna record. And now I'm going to open it up for questions.